So lesson one is a pro legomena, establishing the theological and hermeneutical method in approaching Zephaniah. Before we even get to the text of it, it's important that we establish our method. And a lot of what we're going to cover here is applicable to uh, most of the books of the Old Testament, in fact, all of the books of the Old Testament, really, particularly the prophetic books. And really what we're going to look at in this lesson are interpretive axioms as you approach the Bible. These are things that you should, frankly, assume as you approach Scripture. And two things primarily. One, priority is given to covenant and Christ. Covenant, one, is the organic structure. And then two, Christ is the divine center. Covenant's the organic structure of the book. Christ is the divine center of the book. In Zephaniah 3.8, God says, wait for me for the day when I rise up to seize my prey. My decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out my indignation upon them, all of my burning anger, for in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. And then we read in 2 Peter 3, the apostle, who I think is echoing a theme from Zephaniah when he says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 2, wait for and hastening, we are waiting for and we are hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. And then he goes on to say that we're waiting. We're waiting for a new heaven and we're waiting for a new earth. We're waiting for a dwelling place for righteousness. And that's the message of Zephaniah. That's what's going on in this prophetic book. It's the destruction of the old and then it's the consummation of the new. And to get to that place, the destruction of the old and the construction of the new, God begins with a technical plan, as it were. It's a plan, the blueprints for which are written down in the pages of Scripture. It's a plan that He has followed. It's a plan that He will faithfully follow until the new heavens and the new earth are built. His plan is accomplished, and that plan is His covenant. So we want to look at covenant, the organic structure of this book. The Confession of Faith in 7.1 reminds us that the distance between God and the creature is so great that we could never have any fruition of Him as our blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary conde condescension on God's part, which He's been pleased to express by way of covenant. Well, what's a covenant? And it's important that we understand what a covenant is because we, it, a definition of covenant has to be able to accommodate the three major covenantal arrangements that are found in Scripture and that we're going to see are at work in the book of Zephaniah. One would be the covenant of redemption, and we're going to see that in the sovereign provision of salvation and a redeemer in the book of Zephaniah. The covenant of works, which we're going to see is the, the rationale for the just punishment of sin for those who don't uphold the covenant stipulation and then the covenant of grace. And we'll see that throughout in Zephaniah, the promises of grace that are interspersed throughout the book and particularly will come in at the end, the culmination of the book. And I think Meredith Klein provides a good definition of covenant in his kingdom prologue when he writes that a covenant is primarily a legal disposition. It's characteristically established by oath, and it's defined by the, by the terms specified in oath-bound, divinely sanctioned commitments. So do we see a covenant structure in Zephaniah? Well, many scholars, as you probably know, they've observed a close parallel between the structure of biblical covenants and the covenantal arrangements that are prominent in ancient Near Eastern alliances. And in these alliances, a treaty or a ruler would address his vassals by means of a treaty in which he would regulate his relationship to them. And these treaties consistent, uh, consistently consisted of six parts, and Klein goes over these in his structures of biblical authority. You have the preamble, uh, the ruler or the suzerain and would declare who he is, and then you'd have an historical prologue. The deeds of the suzerain would be recounted. Here's what I've done for you. And then you'd have the stipulations. Because I did this for you and because of who I am, this is what is required of you. And then the particular conditions of the treaty, witnesses to the covenant, and then there are, of course, covenant sanctions. If you obey, you'll get this. If you disobey, you'll get this. Cursing for disobedience and blessing for obedience. And scholars have demonstrated how the covenants of the ancient Near East also are, uh, we see them in the basic structure of the covenants of Scripture. Now, why is that the case? Well, to put it really simply, it's because people are created in the image of God. 
And so some of the original structures of how God as sovereign king relates to his people who are under him are also then reflected in earthly kingdoms, earthly kings and people who are under them. And so ancient covenants and biblical covenants will often follow a similar pattern. Uh, so, for example, uh, Klein and his structures of biblical authority outlined the book of Deuteronomy according to that covenant structure. Now, the book of Zephaniah is going to parallel Deuteronomy in a lot of ways, and we're going to explore some of those in the third lesson, and really we'll see it throughout the book. And it, it heavily depends upon Deuteronomy, and that makes the theme of covenant to be even more important in Deuteronomy. In fact, the book of Zephaniah seems to be structured as a covenant document itself. Uh, for example, we can see a preamble, right? The very first verse of Zephaniah. Zephaniah, as the voice of Yahweh, he announces who he is. He provides a rationale for his unusual authority. He shows us his pedigree. This is who I am. And then we can see implicitly in 1 1 an historical prologue. And we can see the historical prologue in the Deuteronomic background, uh, the prominence of the Gentile nations with which Yahweh has uh, dealt in power. We see stipulations as well. In Zephaniah, they're all over the book. We see them in chapters 1, 2, and 3, what God requires of his people. And then, of course, sanctions are seen throughout the book. Most predominantly, perhaps, what Zephaniah is known for is covenant sanctions of cursing. Because you've disobeyed, this is what you're going to get. But interspersed throughout Zephaniah are also sanctions of blessing, particularly when we get to the last section of the book, 3, 9 through 20. And then there are, I think, succession arrangement arrangements or covenant uh, continuity in the very last part of the book, 3, 17 to 20, which takes us to the consummation. Well, because Zephaniah is so heavily dependent on the covenant arrangement, I thought it might be helpful to give a basic overview of the work of God through covenants in Scripture and just touch on in a very in a limited way, at least for now, how they are seen in Zephaniah. First, consider the covenant of redemption. Uh, Charles Hodge, I think, nicely summarizes the covenant of redemption when he says the Father gave the Son a work to do. He sent him into the world to perform it and promised him a great reward when the work was accomplished. And I would add to that the witness and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as well. This is a Trinitarian covenant. And so Hodge continues, such as the constant representation of the scriptures. We have, therefore, the contracting parties, the promise, the conditions. These are the essential elements of a covenant. And the carrying out of that covenant, then, that's the story of the Bible. The history of it, and it's given to us in the Old Testament. The anticipation of it, I think, is given to us in the prophets. The accomplishment of it is given to us in the Gospels. The explanation of it given to us in the epistles. The consummation of it given to us particularly in well, the uh, book of Revelation. And Zephaniah anticipates the outworking of this covenant of redemption in the provision and the accomplishment of salvation by God seen throughout the book, and particularly, again, when we get to that last uh, section of the book. So the covenant of redemption, then, is the technical drawing, as it were, for the covenant of grace. Uh, Voss puts it this way, it is a pattern for the covenant of grace. However, it's more than that. It's also the effective cause of carrying through the covenant of grace. The story of the Bible and the story of Zephaniah is the story of how God glorifies himself through the covenant of redemption, whereby he accomplishes salvation for his people. That's our theology, and that's the context really of every verse of the Bible. Now, what makes this covenant of redemption necessary? And that helps us now to lead into Adam's violation of the covenant of works. God's condescension, as the Confession of Faith puts it, condescension to man by way of covenant is first seen in his covenant with Adam, the covenant of works made with Adam. Adam created after the image and likeness of God. Adam was to have dominion over the created order. He was to exercise rule. He's God's representative. He was to be fruitful and multiply. He was to spread the image of God all over the globe. And under this arrangement, life is promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. And that covenant's a, a merit covenant. It's based upon the principle of God's justice. It's the formula of do this and you'll live. If you do these things, you get the reward in which the inheritance of heaven is to be earned by Adam through his obedience. 
And we can speak of that covenant in two different conditions. Uh, Herman Witsius in his Economy of the Covenants uh, speaks of, of uh, first, the law of nature implanted in Adam at his creation, and then second, the symbolical law concerning the tree of knowledge and good of the knowledge of good and evil. And I would add to that uh, the command to guard and keep the garden. Uh, so basically you have obedience and worship, true obedience, full obedience, true worship. And Witsius defines the law of nature as the rule of good and evil inscribed by God on man's conscience, even at creation, and therefore binding on him him by divine authority. So all humankind is obligated to obey God through this covenant of nature. And we could also add to that then the participation of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit at creation aids in our understanding of God's creating work being covenantal as well, particularly the witness of the Holy Spirit in the act of creation as he hovers over the creation scene. This is the appearance of God. We're going to see that in the book of Zephaniah. And this creation work takes on significance in the book of Zephaniah pretty early on because in chapters 1, verses 2 and 3, so right out of the gate, the judgment of God is seen in a reversal of creation. And the coming of God is seen in cloud imagery that Zephaniah is going to present to us. Well, you know Adam fails and all humanity falls with him. But the works principle then contained in that covenant is recapitulated in the, in the subsequent covenant that's made with Noah. In Genesis chapter 9, all flesh that is on the earth is under this covenant. It's seen as well in the Mosaic administration of the covenant, which is informed by the principle of promised blessing for obedience, cursing for disobedience. The Mosaic economy, it's still a gracious covenantal administration, but nevertheless, it is one which on the uh, material level is based on the principle of do this and live, works righteousness, if you will. Uh, Klein notes in Kingdom Prologue that it's notably outlined here in the sanctions of Deuteronomy 28 and 29. This works righteousness is found in the sphere of the typical, of the symbolic, the earthly, physical uh, blessings for obedience point to the archetypical reality of covenant fulfillment in Jesus Christ in his heavenly kingdom. And that's further seen as well in the Davidic administration of the covenant. And we'll see the significance of that as well in Zephaniah. The king of Israel, the type of Christ, is seen in a covenant of works arrangement, the political entity of Israel as a nation is a type of the kingdom of Christ. David, the Davidic administration of that political kingdom and administration of the covenant of works at a typological level. And again, you see that formula there, do this and live sanctions that are given to Israel during the monarchical period. And at the same time, on the archetypical level, again, the Davidic covenant is a ministration of the covenant of grace. It's a means by which, how's Jesus going to come through uh, the Messiah? He's going to keep the covenant of works. The Messiah is coming through the line of David. Now, why is the covenant, why am I spending time talking about the covenant of works in Zephaniah? Because it helps us to understand the sanctions that are pronounced by Zephaniah. With respect to the creation covenant, you see a decreation scene in 1.3. We will also see the sanctions that are pronounced on pagan nations for disobeying the law. Nations like Edom and Assyria, they're not participants to the covenant of grace, but they're still prosecuted by God for violations of the law. So the covenant of nature, the creation covenant. In fact, most of the book of Zephaniah is going to be seen as, as the terrible punishments due to those who stand in violation of the covenant of nature. In Zephaniah 1, 3, we see an allusion to the Noahic covenant. We'll see here the idea of God sweeping away man and beast, cutting off humankind from the face of the earth, something that we see in Noah as well. The disinheritance from the land. Chapters 1, verses 2 and 3 and 18, we see the Mosaic Covenant. No land for you. In the Mosaic Covenant, particularly, you see a prototype of the day of the Lord in the Mosaic Covenant. I'll give you just an example of this now. Uh, in Zephaniah 1.15, we'll see these words, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. 
And these seem very clearly to be drawn from Deuteronomy 4.11, where God gives his covenant to Moses. And he says, you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. And these three words, darkness, clouds, and thick darkness, come from root words that appear together only twice in the Sinai Theophany, Deuteronomy 4.11, Deuteronomy 5.22 and 23. And besides their use in Zephaniah and those two uses in Deuteronomy, they only appear in Joel 2.2 as they describe the day of the Lord. This is what's happening in Zephaniah. And then there are judgments, judgments that fall upon the kingly line because of their disobedience. We'll see that in 1.8 and 3.3, the Davidic covenant anticipating the messianic king is going to come and he's going to keep the covenant. But Zephaniah also, thankfully, contains this wonderful promise then of the covenant of grace that's brought to fruition in the revelation of the Messiah. So rather than leave humanity there in sin and death, God graciously provides the covenant of grace through which humankind can receive eternal life, not through their own works, but through the work of a redeemer one who would buy back from man from his slavery, earn salvation for him. In the covenant of grace, Christ earns salvation for his people by his meritorious keeping of the covenant of works on their behalf, and then his righteousness imputed to them. Klein puts it this way in, I think it's God, heaven, and harm. Again, this, the son earns the kingdom reward by the meritorious accomplishment of his messianic mission. And in the covenant of grace, that kingdom reward is given to his people by making them co-heirs with him of what he has earned by, by works in the eternal covenant. And where do we see this covenant of grace and how might we see this initially reflected in Zephaniah? Well, the first revelation of the covenant of grace is what's commonly known as the Proto-Evangelion, the first promise of the gospel, Genesis 3.15. God tells the woman or tells the enemy, uh, Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. You shall bru- he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And then every subsequent administration of the covenant of grace then is a further revelation of the outworking then of this initial gracious promise in Genesis 3.15. Klein again puts it this way, subsumed under the whole traditional design covenant of grace is that series of redemptive administrations of the kingdom from the fall to the consummation culminating in the new covenant. So then we see the Noahic covenant, the covenant with Noah in Genesis 6, 18, the first time we actually see the word covenant, berit, in Scripture. And it's a covenant that is formed very uh, using language that very closely reflects the creation covenant, Genesis 6, 20. You can see that in line with Genesis 1, 24 and 25, but it's distinct from uh, the creation covenant. And there's an allusion, as I mentioned already, to the Noahic covenant in Genesis 1-3. But the significance of that, and we'll see it when we get there, it's speaking of judgment, but it's also speaking of redemption at the same time. It rescues the godly race from the ungodly race. The, The ungodly are disinherited from the land, and they're given a new earth for the people of God. And more on that, you know, when we get to that text. And that's a pattern. We're going to see that pattern throughout the book of Zephaniah as the judgment that is enacted upon the enemies of God serves to provide relief to the people of God. And that's a constant theme throughout the book. Judgment, redemption, they go hand in hand. And the Abrahamic uh, covenant, and you see, of course, the Abrahamic covenant in several chapters in Genesis 12, 15, 17, and so on, the redemptive blessings that are promised. And those redemptive blessings are promised to spread throughout the earth through Abraham. You see it in 12, 3, and 18, 18, 23, 18. And it's clear that these redemptive blessings aren't according to the works-based do this and live formulation of the, of the Adamic administration of the covenant of works, but according to a different principle. It's imputed merit. And in this covenant, God himself says, I'll fulfill this. And you see that dramatically portrayed for you in Genesis chapter 15, when God himself swears to fulfill the covenant. He walks between the severed halves of the covenantal sacrifice. We see an echo of this in Zephaniah 1, 7. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. 
And in Genesis 15, God is assuming all of the responsibility for carrying out the promises of His covenant with Abraham, and most significantly, assuming all of the curses for violations of the covenant. And you're going to see allusions to the covenant of Abraham in different ways throughout the book of Zephaniah. For example, in 1.7, I mentioned this one, the Lord preparing a sacrifice, Himself preparing the sacrifice. Chapter 2, we'll see the curses against the nations. Uh, remember what God says to uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. We see that happen in the book of Zephaniah. Chapter 2 and verse 6, the promise of a land inheritance is going to be given. Chapter 2 and verse 11, the nations bowing down to the Lord. We'll see it again in 3.9, the peoples, the gamim, will be enabled to call upon the name of the Lord, a fulfillment to the promise made to Abraham. In 3.20, God's going to make His people renowned among all the peoples of the earth. And we could go on, lots of allusions to the Abrahamic covenant. And then the Davidic covenant. The line of Abraham to Christ, of course, runs through David and the covenant that is established with him as a kingly type of Christ. And we've mentioned how the covenant of David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, exhibits the characteristics of the covenant of works in the typological sphere. Uh, he is warned against a failure to disobey the great king. His descendants would inherit the curses of his disobedience. And in Zephaniah 1.8 and 3.3, we see that the punishments to be enacted upon the royal line of Israel are a demonstration of the typical role then uh, that the king had in his obedience to the law of God. But at the same time, the Davidic covenant was a further revelation of an administration of the covenant of grace in a unique way. David the king foreshadows the work of Jesus the king. One of David's first acts is the return of the ark, God's presence with His people to Jerusalem, 2 Samuel 6. And it's a presence that we're going to see in Zephaniah is withdrawn then, but it's promised to return. He's a kingly type of Christ's role in restraining and conquering His and our enemies, right? Shorter Catechism uh, number 8. And the apex of this kingship is the gathering of materials for the building of a semi-permanent house of God in the land where God would dwell with His people. And in that we see echoes both of the covenant of creation, the house, the temple, the garden where God would dwell with Adam, and we also see prophetic glimpses of the incarnation of King Jesus, the fulfillment of the promise that He would dwell with His people uh, given in the Davidic covenant. And again, that's a promise confirmed in Zephaniah. We'll see it in the very first verse. He traces his lineage back, guess where, to the line of David. And Zephaniah, born of the line of David, Christ, of course, is born of that kingly line, and he's going to come as the rightful heir to David's throne as both son of David and son of God. And he's going to bring the Davidic covenant to its culmination in his work. And Paul even speaks of this in the book of Romans. So in Zephaniah, we see the promise then of rest. Rest from David's enemies. 2 Samuel 7, 9 through 11. We see echoes then of Psalm 23 in Zephaniah 3, 13. They shall graze and lie down, and none of them shall be afraid. This is the work of David. This is the work of Jesus. And then the new covenant. And the new covenant is really anticipated at, it, at the very inception of the covenant of grace, as well as throughout its unfolding. It's certainly seen, of course, in Genesis 3.15, He shall bruise you on the head. It's seen in the Noahic covenant through the line of Shem and the promise of the blessings upon uh, the nations through Abraham, the Matthew 28.19, the fulfillment of the Davidic kingly line, go, make disciples, says the king. And the message of the prophets, uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 and 32, the whole of Zephaniah chapter 3, 9 through uh, 20 can be seen as a prophetic anticipation of the new covenant and its consummation. So what Zephaniah presents us with then is a theological crossroads between the covenant of works and grace. The context of Zephaniah is that of a renewal of the Mosaic covenant through Josiah's reforms, but the promises of deliverance are founded upon and they're contingent upon the work of the Messiah through the covenant of grace. And the fulfillment of the covenant of works would come in the anticipated Messiah 
the second, the final Adam, the only one, the only king who would be free from a sinful nature, be fully human and fully divine, of royal lineage, able to keep the law in all of its parts perfectly, and also be able to impute his righteousness to his people. David could never have done that anyway. And also to bear their sins in his body at the cross. And this covenant emphasis coupled with the prophet's ministerial context, the numerous parallels that we see between Zephaniah and Deuteronomy, I think they demonstrate that as much as any book, and maybe even more than most of them, Zephaniah can only be understood fully in light of Scripture's covenantal construction. It contains the indictment against Judah, the indictment against the nations for the violation of the covenant of works, and it presents a Redeemer who keeps it for the remnant and the hope of the covenant of grace, eternal life, new creation to come. So covenant is the organic center of the book of Zephaniah. But Christ is the divine, covenant is the organic structure of Zephaniah. Christ the divine center of Zephaniah. We're going to rely in these classes on the axiom that the atelic destination or the end point of every pericope, every passage of Scripture, is the revelation of the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, preaching primarily uh, to, uh, from the Old Testament, is preaching to the, the Gentiles. What's he preaching? The unsearchable riches of Christ. He resolutely declares, we preach Christ crucified, 1 Corinthians 1, 23. He determines in his preaching not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, also 1 Corinthians 2, 2 Corinthians 4. In the first chapter of Corinthians, what does Paul do? He expounds on the cross of Christ from what? The Old Testament. In chapter 15, he proclaims that the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ is of first importance when I preach. In Romans chapter 1, he says the gospel was announced by God himself in the Old Testament, and that gospel is preached to Abraham, Galatians 3.8. And then Peter speaks of the gospel being preached in Noah's day, 1 Peter 3. It's proclaimed by the prophets, Peter says. In Acts 3, Peter says, all the prophets announced the suffering of Christ, and Christ fulfilled those pronouncements, Acts 3, 18. And that message included the resurrection, the restoration, the exaltation, the consummation, all as part of that story. So whatever the writer Zephaniah may have understood, the intention, the intention of the author of God is the pronouncement of the person and work of the Son of God. So the glory of Christ is the redemptive concern of the Old Testament. As our own uh, Lane Tipton has put it, the historical interest contained within the Old Testament must be subordinated to the redemption that is found in Jesus Christ. So for Paul, the person and work of Christ aren't subjects added to Scripture, as Lane Tipton has spoken on that so well, has written on that. Rather, they form the indigenous and essential core of Scripture's message. I'll continue uh, quoting Tipton a little bit here. The Old Testament demands on its own terms that Christ fulfill its message through his death and burial and resurrection. Paul's sense is not that the Old Testament scriptures somehow became the reality according to which Christ died and was raised only when viewed from the vantage points of Christ's resurrection ex post facto. And as Tipton describes it, the Old Testament is not polymorphic. It doesn't exhibit a variety of meanings as redemptive history unfolds. That's not what we're looking for in Zephaniah. It's Christomorphic. It demands that Christ must fulfill what's contained here. And that's nothing less than what Jesus himself says. Everything written about me in Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled, Luke 24. So as Graham Goldsworthy puts it, we must recognize that the proper interpretation of any part of the Bible requires us to relate it to the person and work of Jesus Christ. So let's think a little bit before we finish this first lesson here about unity and progression then in the message of Scripture and how that might relate to the book of Zephaniah as we move forward. Scripture's unified story leads to the manifestation of the glory of God through that work of redemption. From the very first verse, 
the story of Scripture, and we'll certainly see this in Zephaniah from the very first verse, the story of Scripture is consistently forward-looking, always pushing forward from the covenant of works established in the garden, the covenant of grace in 315, the subsequent confirmation of and expansions of God's covenant promise to the establishment of a typological kingdom in Israel, to the expectations of the prophets, what are they looking for, to the eschatological horizon of the New Testament, the movement of redemptive history is, as Voss puts it, a consistent straining forward to what lies ahead, pressing on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3. So the agenda of Bible study, our agenda, the way that it's expressed in Colossians 1, 27 and 28, I think you folks from the Reform Forum would know this, includes presenting everyone mature in Christ. As through the ministry of the Word, then believers are transformed as they wait for the consummation. When you hear the Word, you do so in the context of being seated in the heavenly places, Hebrews chapter 12. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, the eschatological Spirit of God himself, himself brings the power of the glory to come to bear upon your context as you read the Word, as you hear the Word. The future life of the believer projects itself into the present life. Voss puts it this way. The believer has been translated into a state which, while falling short of the consummated life of eternity, may yet truly be characterized as semi-eschatological. So as we study the book of Zephaniah, that eschatological hope is constantly held out before us. It is the consummate glory of God. That's what we're looking for. That's what we'll find. That's the hope. That's the reward toward which we press as we look at this book.